That is. Oh. Hello. 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 It's nice to see the two of you in the same room. Yeah. Yep. We finally reached the level of technology that you can find into Zoom on 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 in the rooms now. <laughs> I feel like I feel like it's a little bit of um this kind of like video conferencing industry is a little bit like clouds where like everyone wanted to sell their solution and yeah. so like you did every single every single piece of hardware um uh, was somehow relying on the cloud infrastructure. Welcome everyone. I just uh, dropped the link to the notes doc into the chat. So if you could indicate that you're here, I appreciate it. And we'll wait a couple more minutes for people to stroll in because that's usually how things work. All righty, well, it's five past the hour, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I said, if you haven't yet put your name on the uh, note stock, please do that. Um, we'll go through the usual reminders that this meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the Guac YouTube channel. Um, and this is an open SSF meeting subject to the open SSF code of conduct and the Linux Foundation antitrust policy, both of which are linked in the meeting notes if you need to refresh yourself on those. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over. Is there any, anyone here that's uh, here for the first time or for the first time in a while? You want to say hi? Go ahead, Mihai. Yeah, I think I'm new. I, I, I haven't been joining in a while, so I just wanted to say hi because I just it just happened that I could join today. So I'm glad to have I'd you be, here. Thank you. Mm 
Okay. Any anyone else want to jump in and say hi? Alrighty. Um, so up next, I uh, added this kind of last minute, but I figured, oh, we should probably at least mention the releases that we've had since the last month's community meeting. Um, as you can see, there have been several guac releases, mostly of the bug fix nature. But um, do any of the maintainers want to talk about what have gone what has gone into any of those uh, recent releases? Uh, do you want to talk a bit to that? Uh, hold on, my headphones aren't working. We can hear you, if you can hear us. All right, uh, I can give a quick, quick update. Uh, so I think a lot of the guac releases have mostly been for improvements. Uh, so we've been trying to optimize uh, either optimize how the, the way and does some queries um, at the same time, uh, you know, we added the ability to query, you know, on ingestion to license scanning, all those kind of things. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's been a lot of improvements, how to, how to improve the performance uh, on some of these things, make sure that we're, you know, we're not getting rate limited by, you know, clearly defined all those kind of things. Um, so, uh, and we, same for the certifiers, we made them more efficient. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a better, query, uh, more efficient query that checks all the packages that need to be scanned uh, based on a timestamp. So that if there's, you know, based on the users, if the user wants to scan every four hours, every 24 hours for vulnerabilities, it's all configurable. And then now, you know, every time the certifier kind of runs, it's going to make sure that it's only going to check packages that need to be scanned and not, you know, like let's say they've been scanned or you ingested an SBOM and it just got scanned on ingestion, then those will not be included, right? So basically, it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, performance and uh, uh, usability improvements there. Um, and then at the same time, uh, we're still working on some PRs for the REST API to, uh, you know, so it's, it's much easier to query for packages, you know, package licenses, vulnerabilities, all that kind of stuff, just via, via REST. Um, so. I think Marco and uh, Nathan uh, are both kind of working on that. Mm -hmm. That's still in review. Great. Thank you. Any questions on the Glock releases? Um, I do want to point out, I think it was in 0 0.8.9, uh, there was a small uh, compatibility breaking change in the vulnerability query, um, the arguments for that. So that is documented. Um, in the release notes for that, as well as if you go through like the demo flow, it points out that you need at least 0 0.8.9 or later uh, for that to work. Well, we're talking about vulnerability stuff. There's also some ambiguity within the in total vulnerability predicate that we are fixing. Um, this shouldn't break the vulnerability query flows, but it may make it so that if you had previous ingested um, JSON blobs from the certifier, they would have to be regenerated. Awesome. Uh, I saw someone adding um, some notes under the visualizer updates as well. Yeah, that was me. Um, oh, that's you. Yeah. Uh, so we also pushed out a new version of the guac visualizer, the the experimental guac visualizer, um, but it includes um, just some you know sort of routine updates to dependencies and stuff. But uh, it does include a new feature for displaying um, known package information. I gave a demo of that, uh, I believe, in last month's community meeting, um, but it's now merged and released. Um, and along the way, we uh, we added um, CI builds for uh, Guac Visualizer because as we tried to release, we kept discovering um, things, dependencies in the build pipeline that had changed. Um, and so now, uh, hopefully, when people make contributions to Guac Visualizer, we'll catch some of the errors sooner. Um, in fact, we've actually had several people making contributions as part of Hacktoberfest. Uh, so that's really awesome to see. 
Um, any questions or comments on the visualizer? All right. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is just a rundown of some decisions on the backends we use. Um, so if anybody wants to to speak to that, it's kind of what it says on the tin here in the notes. But if there's any more uh, context to add. No, maybe I can talk a little bit about it and then others can chime in. Uh, I think over, over the um the, since the creation of like the backends and stuff like that i think we saw a few backends come and go you know we started off the key value um uh, we we tried our neo 4j we did rango db and kind of tried to sort out multiple ones and the, i think the idea was like let's provide an interface so that you can create your own backend you can host your own uh i think one thing there, there was kind of two major things that we noticed one of it was every single change you made we had to kind of like support the tree every backend uh, and kind of having that parity within backends was a little bit difficult to maintain, uh, especially also since like different uh, graph data databases would do things in different ways. Some of them more people had ex expertise, and it was a little bit hard to make sure we had feature parity there. Um, and the second was that for a lot of the other backends that uh, we were running in parallel, I think most of them like a lot of people ended up defaulting to you know i can't run some of those things within my my production environment or you know even if we did uh neo4j uh like i think amazon cloud has jupiter which is a slightly different version of neo4j uh and so i think we also realized the queries that we were doing a little bit simpler so i think we are deciding to kind of simplify things a little bit, like focus on one backend, um, make that good, start answering the questions, um, Postgres and true end um, seems to be something that people like and people are able to deploy in production. Uh, and so we kind of chose that for now. And then we, uh, our, we will be open to like, expanding that in the future. But I think for now, we realized uh, the overhead for maintaining multiple backends is a bit, a bit high. Mm -hmm. Any uh, questions or comments on that from anyone else? All righty. Um, next up is uh, a topic for um, next Monday's maintainer meeting. Um, I, Brandon, is that you again? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love that. That's all. I think in line with like the the backend discussion, uh, one of the things that that um, has been coming up that we've got to feedback on is GraphQL is a little bit difficult to pick up um and integrate with current existing infrastructure given that we are choosing to only have one backend and that back backend being the the kind of like sql based postgres backend uh to end um this provides a pathway for us to say we are going from um you know you don't have to use graphql you can use sql instead and I think the hope here is to, you know, as we, as we realize like the GraphQL uh, schema isn't, every time we want to write a different query or, you know, be able to write a certain reject or like check for prefix of a certain field, we have to change the schema. And so like moving to SQL uh, will kind of be able to, you'll be able to do that without having to constantly update the GraphQL. So I think this opens up the possibility to just query SQL. And you know, for folks that may not be familiar with, with GraphQL, um, hopefully they're familiar with SQL. <laughs> and and you know, hopefully this should make things easier for folks to start, start developing and, and getting insights out of, out of the graph. 
Um, again, I think I think we we have some discussions that need to happen around um, what the SQL interface will be. You know, at, at to start, I think it will be kind of like whatever NX, like the Postgres database exposes to end. But you know, this is where I think we we would like feedback also from folks about you know how they are going to be querying the interface and also uh, what they are expecting of um, querying the SQL. Brandon, I don't know if you saw Mohammed's comment in the chat. Um, so his uh, settings won't allow his audio input, but he said he was about to suggest adopting a plugin architecture with clear proto contract. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a that's a good point. Well, we um uh we were briefly discuss discussing about that and around like exporting the ontology into into like a JSON or prototype format, which is will be part of those discussions. So it it sounds like you have some great ideas around that, Muhammad. Like I think it would it would be appreciated um if you could. You know, if if you if you can find the time to join in on the maintainer meetings and can maybe chime in on some of these things, uh, because I think that is definitely on the table. Um, you know, moving away from from, you know, SQL as a query language is one thing, but really, Guac um ontology is you know what the main thing we want to be able to query, right? So SQL is just like one vessel for it. All right. Anything else on this topic? Wait. It sounds like a no, so let me switch to the share. Let's see. Is it sharing what I wanted to share? Let's find out. All right. So are you seeing some Google Slides or is it sharing the notes doc? It's in the slides. Okay, cool. Um so I wanted to kind of give an update. Um about a little over a month ago, we were working with uh John O. Bacon as part of the community leadership core and talking about, you know, how we can um get a better sense of what people are trying to do with Guac. And, you know, where sort of they fall out of, uh, you know, the demo flow. And so we kind of figure out like, where are the pain points we need to address? So one of the things he suggested was creating a short, uh, he called it a sizzle reel, um, you know, basically a minute and a half to two minute video that, you know, kind of explains um, why people might choose Guac, what problem it solves, et cetera. So I went and had fun and made one of those. Um, actually made two versions. One is embedded in the docs page and the other one is sort of a standalone uh, that we can use elsewhere that tells people to go to the docs. Um, I highly also... recommend watching that video. <laughs> it, it, it made my day. I, I, I'm glad to hear it. It's, um, it's a lot of fun. And I'm trying to think of like, all right, what other silly videos can I make now? Um, but as part of that too, we also reworked the demos a little bit. Uh, I, I went with a lighter approach um, just because I didn't want to be making a lot of wholesale changes without uh, any real evidence or reasoning other than I think it should be this way. Um, so what I did is I split up a couple of pages just so that they were uh, a little smaller so we can kind of track like, you know, step by step. Um, pages that had like showed logs, like log output. I threw all that down at the end as sort of like a, Hey, if you're really interested in doing this, you know, here's what the logs look like, but we didn't want, we wanted to kind of keep people engaged through the demo steps. And then at the end of each page, there's a, okay, well now let's do this next step and a link to it. So over, we did that. We did those changes a little over a month ago now. So we have some data to, to actually show. Um, so first the setup pages was where I split out a couple of things. Um, so you can, this is the Google analytics. So you can kind of see how, um, we have very small percentage of visitors going to the start, uh, 
demo guac with um page actually going to the next the install step which i thought thought was uh both interesting and slightly sad um so this is just the sort of the retention so if you start starting from the start page to the install and start page we keep 20 percent of people but 82 percent of the visitors went somewhere on the site after that um, which is good it maybe suggests that people are just kind of poking around uh, or maybe things aren't as well organized um, as we'd like uh, people who install get through install and start um, 40 percent of them go on to ingest the data um, and then surprisingly only 11 percent of people um, go from the in ingest the data page to the start of the actual demos, which um, kind of surprised me because if you went through that trouble, like why aren't you doing anything with it? Um, and so we can see like, so on the left-hand side, this is the um, people who started from the demo page, did the install, did the ingest, and then where they went after that. So some of them went to the demos or directly to other pages. Some of them clicked around outside the demos, went back a page. Um, if we look on the right-hand side, everyone who started on this page, no matter how they got to it, um, we can see that a lot of them went to, you know, either directly into a demo or to the main demos page. Uh, about the same amount of people went back to the and start um, some people went up to different places. Um, not entirely sure what to make of that just yet, but that's where I welcome people's input. I, I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. Why was the, the follow through from the ingest data pointing to the next? Sorry? Steps? Oh, what was the next steps for ingest data? Which, which, um, page was it supposed to point to? I think it points to the demos that actually have to go look real quick. Um, let's, let's look. Yeah. So it actually does go to the expanding your view. Okay. So maybe my numbers are a little wrong, but actually, uh, that makes it slightly even lower, um, from, you know, the, the main setup flow. Um, and so that might be a thing where it's like, okay, we need to simplify the path a little bit for people. When we get into the demos themselves, um, a, a big chunk of people go to the first actual demo, um, and then we have a lot more people going again, sort of, sort of like random things, going to um, particular parts of the demo and not going through the, the full flow step by step. Um, so again, we can kind of see we um, better numbers than say 11%. Um, but what's really interesting is going from what's known and what unknown to querying vulnerabilities and then going from querying vu vulnerabilities to reacting to a supply chain incident, 53 and 63%. Um, and then only 40% went on to the patch plan from that. Um, but from the querying vulnerabilities and the reacting to a supply chain incident, 100% of the visitors went somewhere else on the site after those. Um, which kind of suggests to me that those are the things that people really, really care about. Um, and I, I have some takeaways at the end and then, you know, um, welcome disagreement or things that I may have overlooked. Um, so if we just look at the overall retention real quick, uh, we do have people coming back. Um, uh, you know, not everyone who uh, comes to the site, but we, you know, a fairly healthy number of people come to the, and again, this is just for the doc site. Um, they come, they go away, they come back. Uh, what I thought was interesting oh, was, um, you know, we definitely, there's a, a drop off and after about three weeks, um, they, they, uh, we don't get really a lot of, um, return visitors, which kind of, which suggests to me that, you know, if we want to try and get people, um, you know, regularly using guac, we really need to get them, you know, kind of get them hooked in that first week or two. Um, I I suspect that 
you know, one explanation is that people try it out and they decide not to, you know, install it and do whatever. Um, another explanation is they have it up and running and they have no need to come back to the docs page again. Um, I, one of the things we have uh, through Hacktoberfest is um, some issues that people are working on to add more reference materials, like, you know, a man page type documentation and things like that, uh, which I think would be helpful to people. And then because if we, you know, we could see people returning to that as they, um, you know, are using Guac more. Um, oh, wrong button. Um, so I threw in a couple uh, YouTube graphs of the, from the sizzle reel stat. So, you know, we're, 34 people have viewed it of, you know, the 255 people or so who viewed the page. So not a ton, but, um, you know, maybe it, it does help a little bit. We are pretty consistent in, you know, getting a view or two every few days. Um, one thing I thought was really interesting is that, you know, we have that big drop off in, uh, you know, in viewer retention that you see. I don't think almost every YouTube video, like people, it starts playing or, or they get bored very quickly. But really after, um, you know, after the first 15 or 20 seconds, people, if they're still watching, they'll watch through most of the end, um, which I thought was encouraging. I think that means that we're telling the story well and hopefully being entertaining. Um, one thing that was kind of amusing to me just from a vanity standpoint is uh, the average view length is 46 seconds, which happens to be when it switches away from my face to a screen grab of the guac visualizer. So clearly people are just watching for me, um, which is fun. Uh, so anyway, the, the takeaways that I took from this is that people do care about what guac does. You know, they're interested in learning more and poking around. Um, like I said, we really have two to three weeks at max to get folks committed to um, using Guac. Um, I think what's pretty clear is that the vulnerability query and response is what people are most interested in, at least among the things that we actually have you know, on the site. Uh, and that our installation steps have really poor retention. Um, you know, one thing we could do is like break it down even more more deeply into like each step is its own page. And then we could get really granular, granular with where people stop. I think that's probably too user hostile to be worthwhile. Um, but, you know, one thing we may want to consider is, you know, how we can further simplify the installation process um, or like, you know, have a demo container that people you know, we ha already have the compose file, but like, are there ways we can, you know, not have to make them separately grab the data and all of that? Um, you know, there are some some options there. Um, so the next steps that I saw uh, were to reorder some of the demos to, you know, like let's put the vulnerability searching first. And then if people are still interested, they can learn about like, here's all the random stuff you can explore about your supply chain. Um, because that seems to be clear, the clear thing that people are care about. Uh, one thing, another thing I want to add is a run in production page that just, you know, gives some basic, Hey, you're ready to use guac for real. Here's some, um, you know, our suggested settings for, you know, how you tune certain variables, um, how you, you know, what kind of hardware you need to, you know, resources to you know, support the database and the network queries and all of that. Um, one, because I think that's going to be helpful for people who want to do it anyway, but also then at each, at the end of each demo page, we can say, Hey, if you're ready to run guac in production, go here to see our advice, um, which gives us a little better idea of why people aren't moving on to the next step. Um, and if they go to the run in production page, it's because they're sold. They don't need more demo. Um, and you know, if they just disappear off the site or they go somewhere else, then we know that the we're not making the case well to them or we're not a good fit for their use case. Um, I think one of the, one thing we could do as well is just making sure that it's very clear on each page, hey, this is the part that's saying the next step. And there's a few pages where it's kind of buried in a paragraph. 
Um, so just want to make sure we kind of highlight that as, hey, if you if you want to keep going with the demo, mm -hmm. click here. Um, we also need to add a demo for certify legal stuff um, just because, you know, that's uh, something we have a lot more capability for than when most of these demos were written. And it'd be good to highlight because that's something that does seem to be of interest to a lot of people, at least anecdotally. Uh, and then, of course, any other ideas that people have about how we can improve the documentation or the demo flow specifically to, you know, one, better engage with pe people as they're going through it so they stay interested. Uh, and two, also kind of make sure that we're doing a good job of positioning Guac as um, like making the case for it and getting people to understand why they might want to use it. Um, so that's all I had there. So if there are questions or comments or anything else, um, I'd be happy to discuss that for a few minutes. I think that's super cool. Um, one of the things that I was thinking a little bit about um, I think the, the idea of having the follow-up at the end of like the next steps also gives us some insight into, I think you were saying like whether they got through, um, the entire article. Right. Um, and I'm wondering whether like right now, I think we, we have like one link that points to the next thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know whether we could have like suggest a few things. And then see what people are the most interested in, like see where like most of the flows are going into. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, and that's kind of what I wanted to do with the run in production page, but we could also have like, you know, a couple different, you know, for each page kind of you know, see like what are the logical next steps that we think people would be interested in. And just, you know, we have a list of like, hey. All right, here's next. Here's one of these things you might want to do. Um, because you know, obviously, like the more um the more we understand how people are using the site, um, that gives us a lot of information that, you know, if they don't come talk to us, we don't know about. So I think that's a good idea. One of the other things I also noticed if you go back to the engagement, I think site eight or site nine. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to figure out what, like, is this the, is the retention kind of how long they're viewing the website? Because it kind of gets me thinking, like, does this mean that all our demos should be two minutes max, you know? <laughs> like, it should never take you more than that. That's, that's a separate measure. Um, I'd have to, we can dig that out. I think it was averaging, like, the average uh in, engagement time was like two minutes or something um but i think this is basically you know from day zero how long does it take people um like how how long do they stay engaged with the site like when when do they return um the other thing of course is that this is you know for the last 42 days basically i started it from when we merged the changes to the demo site till yesterday. Um, so, you know, basically anyone who um, started, who came to the site, you know, say a week ago, well, they're never going to, they're not going to go past seven days because that's in the future still. Um, so it might be interesting to go back and revisit this in a little bit for that same window, but say a month, you know, a month from now. Um, so that just so that way we, you know, we're not half the period is, you know, figure we're getting co viewers consistently. Um, half of them will just not ever have the opportunity to hit this window because they started, you know, after the halfway point. So. I think Muhammad had a comment. I, I can see it there. Yeah, I need to. Oh, there we go.
Yeah, so Mohammed said maybe consider integrating GitHub stats. I usually go straight to GitHub. Um, let's. Can you follow up on that later? Um, I'm not sure what stats would be useful here. Um, you know, like we, you know, can look at stars and forks and things like that. Um, but you know, one of the things we're trying to learn from this is, you know, why why are people not using like not choosing to run guac um you know one of the things you know candidly we've kind of noticed a lot of times is um that people um are interested in the idea they get they kind of maybe play around for a little bit and it feels you know it's a little too much work to get started or for whatever reason they just you know don't engage um and so i think like the demo flow is where we're specifically looking for that um, but definitely like, you know, there are other things we could be looking at apart from, you know, how people experience the demo. So, you know, uh, if you can follow, let's follow up on Slack later, because I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of different ways we could answer different questions that we can come up with. Did anyone have anything else? Alrighty. Um, and I will. Uh, I haven't made this uh, slide deck public, but I'll I'll do that so that, and put it in the meeting notes so that way um, when we publish that to the GitHub repo, it'll be there if anyone wants to go back and poke at it later. Um, before we get to the upcoming events um are there any other topics that people want to discuss that didn't make it to the agenda today all right um so i'll kind of remind everyone of some upcoming events um first of all we are participating in Hacktoberfest for the docs and Guac Visualizer repos. Uh, obviously, that goes through the end of October. Um, so if you know someone who's looking for a project to earn their four uh, pull requests, uh, we have two that are um, you know open for that. And we've actually ha we've had some pretty good engagement with that so far. Uh, the next weekly maintain. Oh, Jeff, go ahead. Uh, similar to this, yeah. I just wanted to call out. I'll be at I'll be at the South Fusion conference next next week. If anybody wants to talk walk in person, um, I think there might be some call outs with some of the or some discussions on the clearly defined integration as well. Oh, me hi. I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, we can okay. definitely talk on Guac and Guac for ML too. So. So our next weekly maintainer meeting is on Monday. Uh, those are open to everyone in the community. It's where the maintainers talk about, um, you know, planned work and uh, things like that. Um, so everyone's welcome to join. Uh, we do have guac time office hours every fortnight. Um, so the next one will be not tomorrow, but the Friday after. Uh, and those are just sort of open sessions where you can just come in and they're informal. There's no agenda. Just drop in and chat about anything. Uh, and then if you'll be at KubeCon North America in Salt Lake City, uh, November 12th and 15th, um, Kusari will have a booth there. Uh, so I know a lot of people on this call will be there. Um, and there is a uh, open source security on tap party hosted by Kusari, Active State, and Control Plane. So... Um, you know, definitely come join us. That'll be the Tuesday of uh, KubeCon. And then our next monthly community meeting will be right here again on Thursday, uh, the 21st of November. Um, if you have anything that you'd like to share or uh, learn more about, definitely discuss that in Slack or uh, you know, on the mailing lists or anywhere else. Um, I'll, I usually put out a call for agenda items about a week before 
Um, but of course, uh, if you think of something last minute, we're usually pretty flexible on that. All right. Is there anything else I missed? All right. Well, thanks, everyone. It was great seeing you, and we'll see you next month, if not sooner. Thanks, Ben.